So this past week, as I'm reading the parasha, I was really reminded as to how important it is to not only read Scripture, not only pray Scripture, but to study Scripture. And also, besides that, I was reminded as to how important it is to allow Scripture to comment on Scripture rather than reading and listening to a lot of commentaries. And as I say that, here I am ready to give a commentary. Which means, uh, you know, take the good stuff and throw out the bad. What can I tell you? This message is, uh, in a sense, uh, a way to show a little, one way of studying Scripture. So it's going to be a little different than my usual message. And there is a major difference between reading Scripture and studying Scripture. So we'll try and do a little study this day. And as I was reading the parasha, and I was wondering where Tyler would go with his drash, I always hope that when I'm speaking from the, par uh, from the parasha, that um, the person who's doing the drash doesn't do the same thing I'm about to do. But um, he didn't. So in reading Deuteronomy 32, uh, which is the Torah reading for today, uh, I, it, it's about the song of Moses, and I got to the last verse of the song, and that's the verse I want to speak about. In fact, if we're going to go through a number of scriptures, you might want to have a pencil and paper ready, because it's, it's, there are a lot of scriptures. So from this one scripture that we're about to read, I took a journey. I don't know if you ever study Scripture that way. Something hits you in, the, in Scripture, and all of a sudden you're off on a journey to find out what God is really saying. And so here's the Scripture. It's Deuteronomy 32, 43, and it says, Make his people rejoice, O nations, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will return vengeance on his foes and atone for the land of his people. Now, I almost see this, um, I picture this verse as a sandwich. Um, the top line is talking about rejoicing and, and, and praising God. The bottom line is God uh, blessing the land of his people. So we have blessings. And in the middle, you have the avenging the blood of his servants. So let's take a look at this. And then it says the vengeance of his foes. So as we look at this, first of all, his, make his people rejoice, O nations. So this is actually something said to the nations, to the Gentiles, to the non-believers. And in other words, to rejoice with the Jewish people. And then it says, he, meaning God, will avenge the blood of his servants. In other words, if you are cursing the people of Israel, especially if you are killing them, that God will avenge that blood. And then it says, he will return vengeance on his foes. Now, his foes end up being the ones who are against Israel. So he is the one giving out the vengeance. And what he then is left with is atoning for the land of his people. They're not just the people of Israel. They're his people. So, let's start the journey. 
in Romans 15, which actually is also part of the parashah, it's the New Covenant portion of the, the reading, Paul is speaking to the Gentiles, to the Romans, obviously, as he seems to repeat that phrase from Deuteronomy 32, 43, it's, and it's said in this way in Romans 15, 10, and again it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. So, in order to understand sometimes a verse, you can't just look at the verse. You have to look at the context surrounding the verse so you understand where God is coming from, or in this case, uh, Paul speaking on behalf of God. And, and so we are going to start at Romans 15.5 and get a sense of what God is leading up to in this verse. So in, in verse 5 it says, Now may the God of patience and encouragement grant you to be like-minded with one another in the manner of Messiah Yeshua. That's a very interesting verse. So what I'm hearing from this verse is you might have some different theologies, some different cultures, some different things going on in how you are celebrating the Lord, but in the area of Messiah Yeshua, you need to be like-minded. You need to have agreement. You need to be in unity. You need to understand that we as believers, both Jews and non-Jews, have to be in unity about who Yeshua is. This is a crucial part of what draws us into unity, and it's also gives us the ability to overlook other things because this is the major. So let's look at the next verse because it's connected. It says in verse 6, so that together with one voice, just as Messiah also accepted you to the glory of God. Now, two things that struck me here. First of all, is that Messiah accepted us and we need to accept each other. And accepting each other is very difficult because we don't always like what each other does. And somehow we have to accept. And, and that is only through God. And, and we are to be in unity and be one voice. And notice that if we are in unity, if we are in one voice, that actually glorifies God. So we want to glorify God. One of the things we're going to have to do is tear down the walls that are between us and be in unity. So then in verse 7, um, I, okay, I read 7. In verse 8, it says, For I declare that Messiah has become a servant to the circumcised for the sake of God's truth in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. So what do we see here? Messiah is a servant to the people of Israel. He's come to serve. And what does he come to do in that service? He wants to show the truth of God's word, and he wants to show that God's promises are true. And now he says this to the patriarchs, but it's true for everybody that God's promises are true. Now, he's not only a servant to the people of Israel, he's also a servant to the Gentiles because you see in verse 9 it says, and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. So it's a little different as to how he's seen his servanthood to the Gentiles to the Gentiles, it's all about showing mercy to them. And how, how, why is he showing mercy to them? Well, the people of Israel were God's chosen people, and yet he is bringing in these non-believing Gentiles, the nations, to become believers, and it's only done through his mercy that they have been invited. And so now... He's, he's setting up 
this situation between Jew and Gentile as now not only Jews are believers, but also, as we see in Acts 15, the Gentiles are to become believers and they are to be one in Messiah. So the mercy that he showed was to bring in those who were not originally chosen to the chosen group. And we see as it is written in verse 9, also it says, as it was written. And this means that we're about to find some, he some scriptures from the Hebrew uh, Bible because it's as it was written, so it's got to have been done before the book of Romans. And we see here that in verse 9, it says, For this reason I will give you praise among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. So now, let's understand this. The, Paul is saying this. Paul is a Jew. For this reason, Lord, I will give you praise. What's the reason? And I'm going, I'm going to praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name about the fact that you're bringing Jews and Gentiles together. That's why he's praising God. And he just sees this as a remarkable thing that God is willing to do. Because prior to that, there was a major separation between Jew and Gentile. And God is bringing them together. So what are the scriptures? And, and you can see the letter C there at the end of name. That's a footnote. And when you, you know, it's nice we have these modern Bibles with footnotes to help us get to the right places to see what, what, what is connected. And so we see in both 2 Samuel 22.50 and Psalm 18.50, the very same verse, Therefore I praise you among the nations, Adonai, and I will sing praises to your name. There is a concept here where something, somehow our Jewish people missed it. They missed it through the years. And that was that one of their jobs was to bring in the nations into the knowledge of who God was. And yet what they did instead was they kind of put a fence around themselves and, and said, we're clean, you guys are unclean, stay away. And... That's not what God was trying to have happen. Even back here, you can see the scriptures are clear that I praise you among the nations. So that was, that was what we were to do and sing praises to your name to the nations. So in verse 10, going back to Romans, and again, I sa it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Now, that's the verse that we started with from Deuteronomy 32.43. And so I'd like to show you three different translations of that verse. And rather than focusing on the difference, focus on the clarity that the three different translations give us so that we can understand what God is saying here. The first one from the TLV, which is the Tree of Life Bible, says, Make his people rejoice, O nations. The second one is from the JPS. JPS, uh, 1917 edition, is the Jewish Publication Society. And this is a translation by non-Messianic Jews, so people who do not believe in Yeshua. And so this was their translation, Sing aloud, O ye nations, of his people. Which is a very interesting uh, way. We'll come back to that in a second. And then the NASB, New American Standard, says rejoice, O nations, with his people. Now, 
All of these have a similar understanding, but all of them say something a hair different. So, um, the first one, make his people rejoice, O nations, it has a, a totally different sense than sing aloud, O ye nations, of his people. Um, either way, we see in all three of these that his people, which is referring to Israel, but rejoice, O nations, let's take the NASB, with his people, gives you a sense that, as I said before, the nations are to come to Israel, come to the people of Israel and rejoice and celebrate God with them. Now the key here that I'm feeling is that the concept is that Gentiles were supposed to come to the Jewish people and worship God. Now we see in the past 2,000 years that's been turned around a bit. But the question is, are Gentile believers still supposed to join Jewish believers? And I'm not going to be dogmatic about that because I just think that if that's going to ever happen. It's going to be God and not anybody being dogmatic. But we already see it happening. We see it here at Shoresh David. We see it in Messianic synagogues all across the country and the world that people who are not born Jewish are joining with us to celebrate God and looking at the entire scripture, not saying that one part is less than the other, but it's one book by God. And, and so we celebrate Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot because it says so in Leviticus 23. And it's interesting that there are so many places in Scripture that are talking about the nations coming to the Jewish people. So I believe it's actually happening. might be small right now, but uh, we'll see what God does in the future. Psalm 67, 2 through 8, is an interesting scripture. And it's connected, and I'll show you where. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he cause his face to shine upon us, so that your way may be known on the earth and your salvation among all nations. So here it is again. The heart of the Jewish people was to be an example for the nations, set aside not to show the difference, but to, in a sense, to use a, a new covenant thought in reverse, to make the nations jealous of the relationship they had with God. And it says here, Lord, bless us. Make your face shine on us so that the entire earth will know who you are. And then, and your salvation will happen among all the nations. And that's what I pray for daily that salvation will, revival will just be all throughout the world because, as you know, our world needs it. So then it continues, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. So again, we're not talking now about the Jewish nation. We're talking about the world. We're talking about the Gentiles, the nations. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you will judge the peoples fairly and guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. So, I, you know, as a, as a Jewish person growing up, 
I'm, I might have read this, but I had no idea that God was saying that, that, that we are to bring people to the truth. I mean, I, that, that concept just wasn't even close. And so it says, the earth has yielded its harvest. God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. So there is constantly in Scripture this understanding, yes, the Jews, the people of Israel, chosen people, but everybody is to come into that chosenness. Everybody is supposed to come into that chosenness. So then Paul goes into a lot of teaching to explain to the Gentiles that God is not finished with the Jews, that they still have a purpose. So let's continue on with Romans 17, 10, 17, excuse me. So this is the beginning of the parasha for today in the New Covenant. And it's, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Messiah. In context, Paul is talking about the unbelieving Jews. We can tell from the next verse because it says in verse 18, but I say, have they never heard? Indeed, they have. For their voice has gone out into all the world and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not understand? So at one level, the, here it was, the, the voice uh, of, of Scripture that, that the the uh, people of Israel were so careful to keep exactly to what God had had them write and then and keep it exact to the the very exact went out to the entire world but did Israel understand the very words that they sent out and you know I, you have to understand the Orthodox memorize all of Scripture. I mean, the very Orthodox, if, if you speak to them, they, they will know Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and much more me by memory. And yet, did they not understand that was Paul's question. So, first Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation with a nation empty of understanding. I will vex you. Now, again, he was, these concepts are from the Hebrew Scriptures. He's basically saying that the Jews would be provoked to jealousy by the Gentiles. Now, I want you to see a couple of this a scripture that uh, is connected, I believe. It's one that we don't think about being connected to the idea of making Jewish people jealous. But it's Isaiah 52, 7. It says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces shalom, who brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Now, my understanding of this, if I were to say to somebody, your God reigns, then I must be outside that group. So what I'm seeing is that this Hebrew Scripture verse from Isaiah 52, uh, 52 7 is about people who are not Jewish, and how beautiful are their feet because they're announcing peace and good news to Zion, to Israel, and saying, your God reigns. Think about that. Romans 10.20, and Isaiah is so bold as to say, I was found by those who did not seek me. I became visible to those who did not ask for me. But about Israel, he says, all day long I stretched forth my hands to a disobedient 
and contrary people. Two things that are important here, but let's first read a connecting scripture. Uh, Isaiah 65, 1 and 2. Does it sound similar? I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, Hineni, Hineni to a nation not called by my name. I have stretched out my hands all day to re a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own thoughts. So both in, the, in Isaiah as well as in Romans 10 through Paul, we see two things going on here. Number one is that the Gentiles didn't really ask for God, <laughs> but, but they, they got drawn in um, uh, you know, they, it wasn't like they were looking for God, but all of a sudden through the, the, the sharing of faith, the, the, there, there was just a tremendous move of God's Spirit, and they started coming in to the faith. The second thing that's explained here is, and, and look, they were coming in, and we didn't even call them. You know, they, they're just coming in. And, but you Jews who were called, you're disobedient. You're rebellious, and, and you're not listening. The only thing you do is follow your own thoughts. So, it's very important at this point that Paul explains that even though they're disobedient, God has not stopped loving them, and he still considers them chosen, and they still have a purpose. So, unfortunately, we go from the last verse of Romans 10 to the first verse of Romans 11 with a page break. But there wasn't a page break in the original. It didn't say Romans 10 to Romans 11. So right after he talks about the Jewish people being a rebellious people, he says in Romans 11:1. I say then God has not rejected his people, has he? And again, we see this from Jeremiah 31, 37. Behold, the days are coming. It's a declaration of Adonai when the city will be rebuilt. And then it goes on. But in Jeremiah 33, 24 to 26, you can read this along with me. Have you not noticed what this people have spoken, saying the two families which Adonai did choose, he has rejected them? Thus they despise my people, no longer a nation before them. Thus says Adonai. So here's God speaking. If I have not made my covenant of day and night firm, and the fixed patterns ordering the heavens and the earth, only then would I reject the offspring of Jacob. I think that makes it pretty clear. For I will restore them from their exile and have compassion on them. So now, with that in mind, Romans 11.1 1 continues. And so Paul answers the question, may it never be that God's finished with the people of Israel, for I too am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Now, Elijah thought he was the last man standing so to speak. He was the last believer on earth. Uh, and God said, no, I saved 7,000 who will not bend the knee to Baal and, uh, because I will always have a remnant. I will always have a remnant. And so again, we go to 1 Samuel because we want to see what the foundation says about the, this concept, not only the new covenant, so 1 Samuel 12, 22 says, For Adonai will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased Adonai. Now, I think it was yesterday or the day before, I was talking about his name's sake and how in prayer, when Moses prayed, he prayed, Do this for your name's sake, Lord. 
In other words, the nations are going to see what you do, and it's for your name's sake that we want you to do this. And, and again, uh, Daniel did the very same thing. For your name's sake, God, I just ask that the 70 years are up. We need to get back to uh, Israel. That's for your name's sake. So here it is again. For, not for the sake of his people, not because of the people of Israel, but for his great name's sake. And, and so this is, this is a constant theme in Scripture. And, and in Psalm 94, 14, for Adonai will not forsake his people, he will never abandon his inheritance. So this isn't the people's inheritance. This is God's inheritance that he's not forsaking Israel. Paul finally gets to one of his main points, which is to speak to Jewish people about Yeshua. In Romans 11, 11, he says, I say then they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be by their false step. Salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy. And so we see it's the very opportunity that many Jewish people did not come to know Yeshua as their Messiah opened up, in a sense, the opportunity for the nations to come in. And when they came in, one of their jobs was to provoke Israel to jealousy. Now I see three ways that make sense to share with Jewish people. There might be a lot more. Number one, you share from God's Word. We've talked about that in the past. Number two, to make them jealous because of your relationship with the Lord. And number three, to be in unity with Jewish believers for that is what will bring God glory and that is what will bring people to know Yeshua. When people see Jews and non-Jews come together in Yeshua. And so we close with John 17 because that is the very heart of Yeshua as he's praying to the Father in John 17. He says in, in verse, uh, I believe it's verse 20, I pray not on behalf of these only, meaning the Jewish people who have come in initially, but also for those who believe in me through the Jewish people's message, their message, that they all may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, so also may they be one in us so the world may believe that you sent me. The world is going to believe that God sent Yeshua, the Father sent Yeshua, because of our oneness. And so it says, the glory that you have given me, to me I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. Perfected in unity. So that the world may know that you sent me, meaning Yeshua, and loved them as you loved me. So, I don't know if you can remember the scripture that we started with, which was Deuteronomy 32, 43. But the idea of the Gentiles coming into uh, to the Jewish uh, understanding of God and coming into unity as they worship God together. And all throughout Scripture, we can make a case for this actually happening. So I pray a few things now that I've, I've given you this. I pray that you'll see the beauty of studying God's Word and not just reading it, but going on those journeys that, that are so fascinating in God's Word. And, and so you have to... You, one verse leads to another verse which leads to another verse which gives you tremendous understanding. 
Secondly, I pray that you see the beauty of God's heart for the Jewish people, but also for the entire world. God is not saying, I love the Jewish people more. No. He loves all of us, whether we're Jews or not Jews, totally immaterial, and uh, maybe I'm not 100% in agreement with how Tyler phrased it earlier, but I certainly... I, I, I understood his heart, and I understood what he was saying, and I would agree with that. I pray that you see the beauty of Yeshua's prayer and his desire to see Jewish people and those who are not Jewish united as one. And I pray that you see that the unity, both Jew and Gentile, will bring people to know Yeshua. And... So we as a congregation, as a Messianic congregation, it is crucial that we don't have any sense that people, one people, are better than another people. Everybody is the same in the eyes of the Lord, and so everybody needs to be the same in our eyes as well. Rich, poor, uh, whatever the... The differences are we have to make sure that we have empathy and compassion for each other and to share the love that Tyler was speaking about in his drosh is, is a critical factor to making this congregation successful or any congregation actually successful. So I pray that, that this is is going to be your heart to, to, to work on bringing unity, work on not allowing the stuff in this world to separate us and the differences. So it's possible that there's some people who want that unity, but they are not yet part of the remnant of God because God wants us all to be part of his kingdom. And if there's somebody here who has not accepted Yeshua as their Messiah, you are not part of the remnant yet, but you are invited in. And so whether you're here in person or you're on Facebook, I invite you in to receive Yeshua as your Messiah for atonement of your sins and to start a journey that will be greater than any other possible journey you could be on. If that is you, if you're interested in that, just pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm so sorry for my sins. I repent, meaning I want to turn to you. I repent of my sins. I receive Yeshua into my heart, and I am dedicating my life to him. And if you've said those things in your heart and believe it, you are now part of God's kingdom. And I would like to hear from you, either if you're here today after services, please come to me and talk to me. If you're, if you're on Facebook, uh, please call our office call or email us or contact us through our website, Facebook, however you'd like to do it. We, we have material for you a free material that you can have. So let us close in prayer. Lord, in Psalm 133, you said, Hine matovu menayim, shevet achim gam yachad. How good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Father, I pray that whatever bitterness, unforgiveness, or anger people feel in their hearts. I command that to leave right now in the name of Yeshua because they are destructive against unity. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would wash us clean by the precious blood of Messiah, that we would be just clean throughout, our mind would be clean, our heart would be clean, 
Our motivation would be clean. It would be following you godly. And so I pray in the name of Yeshua that we would sense unity, that we would be a family that God has brought together. And just as we say when we marry somebody that if God has brought us together, let no man separate us. I pray that this would be that kind of a family. I pray, O oh Lord, that everybody here would sense the power of your blessing, would sense the power of, of your encouragement and the power of your love. Lord, there are some people who are going to find it hard to understand love because they've never felt real love. And so, Lord, I ask you to go into their hearts right now and touch them and love them and let them feel wrapped in your arms. Lord, bless them now. I pray this in the name of Yeshua.